In this video, we will discuss the facial vasculature, exploring its anatomy, functions, and clinical significance. We will begin our presentation by exploring the arterial supply to the face, starting with a detailed description of the external carotid artery, including its collateral and terminal branches, as well as an overview of the internal carotid artery. Following this, our focus will shift to the venous drainage system, where we will examine the internal, external, and anterior jugular veins in depth. Additionally, we will also delve into the lymphatic drainage, particularly highlighting the lymph nodes of the head and neck, and we will take a closer look at the various levels of the cervical lymph nodes. Before concluding, we will explore some vital clinical correlations, providing insights into how an understanding of facial vasculature can inform medical diagnostics and treatments. The arterial supply to the face is primarily provided by the external carotid artery, a key terminal branch of the common carotid artery. This crucial artery branches out into several major arteries that supply different areas of the face. These include the facial artery, which nourishes the anterior facial structures, the superficial temporal artery, supplying the lateral aspects of the face and scalp, and the maxillary artery, which is responsible for the deep facial regions. This extensive vascular network is characterized by its rich and highly anastomotic nature, meaning that there are many interconnections between the blood vessels. The external carotid artery, a vital component of the facial vasculature, is one of the two primary branches of the common carotid artery and plays a pivotal role in supplying blood to the face and neck. Originating from the common carotid artery at the level of the superior border of the thyroid cartilage, its path is crucial for understanding facial blood flow. As it courses upwards, the external carotid artery takes a slightly anteromedial direction relative to the neck. It then transitions to a more superficial trajectory, positioning itself anterior to the internal carotid artery and posterior to the neck of the mandible. The artery's course is anatomically divided into two distinct regions, the cervical part and the cephalic part. Each region has several key branches with specific roles, cervical part, this segment includes branches like the superior thyroid artery, which supplies the thyroid gland, and the ascending pharyngeal artery, vital for the pharyngeal region. Cephalic part, in this segment, the artery gives rise to branches such as the facial artery, responsible for supplying blood to the anterior face, and the superficial temporal artery, which supplies the temple and scalp. Let's delve deeper into the collateral branches of the external carotid artery. The superior thyroid artery, this artery, the first branch of the external carotid artery, primarily supplies blood to the thyroid gland, larynx, and nearby muscles and skin. The lingual artery, emerging close to the superior thyroid artery, the lingual artery supplies blood to the tongue, floor of the mouth, and tonsils. The ascending pharyngeal artery, often described as the most medial branch, this small artery supplies the pharynx, prevertebral muscles, the cranial part of the sympathetic trunk, and parts of the middle and inner ear. The facial artery, a major artery that curves around the lower border of the mandible and enters the face, it supplies blood to the facial skin, muscles of facial expression, and some areas of the oral cavity. The occipital artery, running posteriorly, this artery supplies blood to the scalp's occipital region, upper neck muscles, and portions of the ear and meninges. The posterior auricular artery, ascending behind the ear, this artery supplies the auricle, the scalp over the mastoid process, and part of the external acoustic meatus. Beneath the neck of the mandible, the external carotid artery divides into its two main terminal branches, the superficial temporal artery and the maxillary artery, one of the largest branches of the external carotid artery. The superficial temporal artery is a prominent feature of the facial vasculature. Emerging above the parotid gland, it ascends anteriorly to the ear, dividing into multiple branches that play a vital role in supplying blood to the temporal region of the scalp. Its palpable nature in this area not only aids in clinical examinations but also underscores its importance in the vascular network of the scalp, forehead, and upper face. The artery's terminal branches, namely the parietal branch, posterior branch, and the frontal branch, anterior branch, have distinct trajectories and supply areas. The parietal branch courses posteriorly and superiorly, catering to the skin and fascia of the parietal scalp region. Conversely, the frontal branch travels anteriorly, providing essential blood supply to the skin and muscles of the forehead. This branch is crucial in cosmetic and reconstructive procedures involving the forehead, as well as in treating frontal scalp conditions. 
Additionally, the superficial temporal artery's involvement in temporal arteritis, a serious inflammatory condition affecting the arteries, makes it a critical focus in both diagnosis and management of this disease. It's also commonly used for measuring arterial pressure, especially in contexts where other sites are not accessible. The maxillary artery, a major branch of the external carotid artery, originates behind the neck of the mandible. It follows a sinuous and deep course, making it less accessible but critically important in supplying various deep structures of the face. The artery has a complex array of collateral branches, each serving specific regions, deep auricular artery, supplies the external acoustic meatus and the tympanic membrane. Anterior tympanic artery, nourishes part of the tympanic cavity. Middle and accessory meningeal arteries, these arteries supply the meninges and the dura mater of the brain and skull. Inferior alveolar artery, vital for the lower teeth, it runs through the mandibular canal. Deep temporal arteries, supply the temporalis muscle, important in mastication. Pterygoid branches, serve the pterygoid muscles, key in jaw movements. Masseteric artery, supplies the masseta muscle, another muscle of mastication. Buccal artery, supplies the buccinator muscle and cheek. Anterior and posterior superior alveolar arteries, supply the upper teeth. Infraorbital artery, supplies the lower eyelid, side of the nose, upper lip, and anterior face. And the descending palatine artery, supplies the hard and soft palate. The maxillary artery's terminal branch, the sphenopalatine artery, is noteworthy for its role in supplying the nasal cavity, and it's often involved in epistaxis. Due to its deep location and the critical areas it supplies, the maxillary artery is of great importance in dental procedures, facial surgery, and in treating traumatic injuries. Its branches are involved in a wide range of functions, from facial expression to mastication, and play a critical role in surgeries of the oral cavity, such as tooth extractions and maxillofacial surgeries. The internal carotid artery, while primarily known for its role in supplying blood to the brain, also contributes significantly to the facial vasculature through its branch, the ophthalmic artery. This artery starts its journey as the internal carotid artery enters the cranial cavity and has a vital role in providing blood to the eye and surrounding structures. Let's explore the branches of the ophthalmic artery that specifically supply the face, the supraorbital artery. This artery travels along the supraorbital margin, supplying blood to the forehead and scalp. The supratrochlear artery, emerging near the medial angle of the orbit, this artery supplies the medial aspect of the forehead. And the dorsal nasal artery, previously known as the external nasal artery, this small artery supplies the skin of the dorsal nose. It is particularly relevant in reconstructive surgeries of the nose and in treating nasal injuries. These arteries form important anastomotic connections with branches of the facial artery, such as the angular artery. This anastomosis ensures collateral circulation, a crucial aspect in maintaining blood flow to the face, especially in cases where one part of the vascular network is compromised. The venous drainage system of the head and neck is an essential aspect of circulatory anatomy, primarily facilitated by three major veins, the internal jugular vein, the external jugular vein, and the anterior jugular vein. The internal jugular vein is the largest of these veins. Originating in the cranial cavity, it extends down the neck, paralleling the path of the carotid arteries. This vein is responsible for draining the majority of the blood from the brain, the superficial parts of the face, and the neck. The external jugular vein is more superficial compared to the internal jugular vein. It forms from the confluence of veins from the scalp and deep parts of the face, and travels down the neck to empty into the subclavian vein. This vein is often visible under the skin and is used in medical procedures like central venous catheterization. And the anterior jugular vein is smaller and runs down the midline of the neck. It primarily drains the superficial structures of the neck and parts of the lower face and jaw. This vein eventually joins the external jugular vein or directly empties into the subclavian vein. All three of these jugular veins converge and ultimately drain into the subclavian vein. This convergence is a crucial part of the circulatory system, ensuring efficient and effective venous return from the head and neck to the heart. The internal jugular vein is a major component of the facial vasculature. In terms of drainage, it is responsible for collecting venous blood from the brain, skull, face, and neck. This includes blood that has circulated through the cerebral veins, cranial nerves, 
and the various superficial and deep structures of the face and neck. The internal jugular vein descends vertically in the neck, slightly anteromedial, positioned within the carotid sheath alongside the carotid arteries. It ultimately joins the subclavian vein behind the clavicle to form the brachiocephalic vein, a key vessel that contributes to the venous return to the heart. The internal jugular vein connects with several veins that directly drain blood from facial tissues. These connections include tributaries such as the facial vein, which drains the anterior face, and the lingual vein, which drains the tongue and floor of the mouth. Through these tributaries, the internal jugular vein effectively gathers blood from the superficial and deep areas of the face. The external jugular vein, a crucial component of the facial vasculature, plays a key role in the venous drainage of the head and neck. Unlike the deeper internal jugular vein, the external jugular vein predominantly drains the superficial aspects of these regions, including the superficial structures of the cranium, the deep portions of the face, and part of the scapular region. This vein originates at the angle of the mandible, formed by the confluence of the posterior division of the retromandibular vein and the posterior auricular vein. Its predominantly superficial course makes it visible in many individuals as it descends obliquely across the sternocleidomastoid muscle. This superficial trajectory not only facilitates easy clinical access for procedures such as venous cannulation but also underscores its importance in draining blood from the facial and cranial regions. The termination of the external jugular vein can vary among individuals. Typically, it empties into the subclavian vein, but in some cases, it may drain into the brachiocephalic vein or join the internal jugular vein. The vein receives several important tributaries, each contributing to its drainage capacity. These include the occipital vein, draining the posterior scalp, the posterior auricular vein, serving the area behind the ear, the transverse cervical vein, draining parts of the neck, and the suprascapular vein, draining the scapular region. Together, these tributaries ensure comprehensive venous drainage from the upper back and lateral aspects of the head and neck. Lastly, the anterior jugular vein, an integral component of the venous drainage system of the neck and lower face, often lies just beneath the skin and subcutaneous tissue, making it visible in some individuals. This visibility is a result of its superficial course and location, making it an accessible vein for certain medical procedures. Originating from the confluence of several small superficial submandibular veins, the anterior jugular vein begins its course under the chin. Its pathway, predominantly superficial, allows it to collect venous blood from the anterior aspect of the neck. As it descends, the vein typically runs along the midline of the neck, superficial to the infrahyoid muscles. This central and superficial course positions it as an important structure in the drainage of the lower face and anterior neck regions. The anterior jugular vein terminates at the base of the neck, where it generally drains into the external jugular vein. However, there can be variations in its termination, reflecting the diversity in human venous anatomy. Along its course, the anterior jugular vein receives several tributaries which enhance its drainage capacity. These include the laryngeal veins, which drain the larynx, small thyroid veins, draining parts of the thyroid gland, and the inferior thyroid veins. These tributaries underscore the vein's role in draining blood from the thyroid region and the lower parts of the throat. Now regarding the lymphatic drainage system of the head and neck, it forms a complex and essential network that includes lymph nodes and lymphatic vessels. This system plays a pivotal role in immune function and fluid balance within these regions. Within this intricate network, lymph nodes are organized into two primary groups, those located in the head and those in the neck. Each group of lymph nodes is responsible for filtering lymphatic fluid from specific areas of the head and neck and facilitating immune responses. In the head, lymph nodes are strategically positioned around areas such as the ears, cheeks, and under the jaw. These nodes receive lymphatic fluid from the scalp, face, and deeper cranial structures, filtering and purifying it before it progresses through the lymphatic system. The neck lymph nodes, including the cervical lymph nodes, are further subdivided into deep and superficial groups. These nodes play a crucial role in managing lymph from the neck, the pharynx, and the thyroid region among other areas. The lymphatic vessels accompanying these nodes have a distinct routing. Vessels on the left side of the face generally drain into the thoracic duct, the largest lymphatic vessel in the body which empties into the cardiovascular system near the junction of the left subclavian and left jugular veins. Conversely, 
those on the right side of the face drain into the right lymphatic duct, a smaller duct that also empties into the cardiovascular system, but at the junction of the right subclavian and right jugular veins. The lymph nodes of the head are an essential component of the body's lymphatic system, extending from beneath the chin to the posterior aspect of the head. They include the occipital lymph nodes, located near the base of the skull at the back of the head, these nodes drain the scalp and the posterior cranial area. The mastoid, or post-auricular, lymph nodes, positioned behind the ear, adjacent to the mastoid bone, these nodes are responsible for draining the surrounding areas of the ear and part of the scalp. The parotid lymph nodes, situated around the parotid gland, near the cheeks, they primarily drain the upper facial region, including parts of the eyelids and external ear. The facial lymph nodes, scattered along the face, these nodes drain various parts of the face, such as the cheeks, nose, and lips. The submandibular lymph nodes, located beneath the jaw, they drain the lower face, mouth, and anterior nasal area. And the submental lymph nodes, found under the chin, these nodes drain the floor of the mouth and the tip of the tongue. All these lymph nodes ultimately drain into the deep cervical lymph nodes, which are aligned along the internal jugular vein. This alignment allows for the efficient transfer of filtered lymphatic fluid from the head to the deeper parts of the neck. The deep cervical lymph nodes act as a crucial checkpoint, further filtering the lymph before it re-enters the systemic circulation through the thoracic duct or the right lymphatic duct. The effective functioning of these lymph nodes is vital for maintaining the immune defense mechanisms of the head region. Concerning the lymph nodes of the neck, these nodes are divided into two primary networks, a superficial network and a deep network, each playing distinct yet interconnected roles. Let's start with the superficial cervical lymph nodes. First, we have the superficial anterior cervical lymph nodes. Located along the anterior jugular vein, these nodes are tasked with the crucial role of draining lymph from the front parts of the neck, including the skin and superficial tissues. Then, there are the superficial lateral cervical lymph nodes, positioned along the external jugular vein and just beneath the sternocleidomastoid muscle. These nodes are responsible for managing lymph drainage from the lateral aspects of the neck and the scalp. The significance of these superficial nodes lies in their role in filtering out pathogens, making them a first line of defense before the lymph progresses deeper into the body. Now, let's focus on the deep cervical lymph nodes. These nodes are strategically situated along the internal jugular vein and deep to the sternocleidomastoid muscle. They are categorized into superior and inferior groups, with each group containing several key nodes. The prelaryngeal nodes drain the area around the larynx. The pretracheal nodes target the tracheal area. The paratracheal nodes focus on the sides of the trachea. The retropharyngeal nodes are responsible for lymph from the pharyngeal region. The infrahyoid nodes cover the area below the hyoid bone. The jugulodigastric nodes, also known as tonsillar nodes, crucial for draining the tonsils and the posterior pharynx. The jugulo-omohyoid nodes handle the area around the omohyoid muscle. And finally, the supraclavicular nodes, located above the clavicle, play a vital role in draining the upper chest and parts of the arm. These deep nodes are instrumental in further filtering lymph from both the superficial nodes and deeper structures of the neck and head, like the pharynx, larynx, and thyroid gland. The lymphatic system in the neck is meticulously organized into specific levels for effective drainage and immune function. These levels are clinically significant, especially in the evaluation and management of head and neck pathologies, including oncological processes. We start with level 1, which is divided into two sublevels. Level 1A includes the submental nodes. These are located under the chin, serving as drainage points for the lower lip, the floor of the mouth, and the tip of the tongue a crucial area for oral health. Level 1b refers to the submandibular nodes. Situated beneath the jaw, they are tasked with draining regions such as the cheeks, upper lip, the body of the tongue, and the anterior nasal cavity. Moving to level 2, or the upper jugular nodes, is further divided into level 2a, which are the nodes are anterior to the vertical plane of the spinal accessory nerve, primarily draining the oropharynx and oral cavity. Level 2b, located posterior to this plane, often involves drainage from the nasopharynx and soft palate. Level 3 contains the middle jugular nodes, which are key in draining the pharynx, larynx, and thyroid gland. Descending to level 4, we encounter the lower jugular nodes, 
extending from the clavicle to the cricothyroid notch, and includes nodes that drain portions of the lower larynx and thyroid gland. Level 5 refers to the posterior triangle nodes, which are categorized as level 5A, containing the spinal accessory nodes that drain the posterior scalp and neck. Level 5B, which includes the transverse cervical nodes and supraclavicular nodes that primarily drain the upper thorax and parts of the arm via the lymphatic ducts. And lastly, we have level 6, known as the anterior compartment nodes. These include the pretracheal, paratracheal, and prelaryngeal nodes. Central in location, they collectively drain the thyroid gland, trachea, and larynx. As we explore these levels, keep in mind their importance in the staging of neck cancer, planning surgical interventions, and predicting the spread of infections or malignancies within the head and neck regions. Our understanding of these lymphatic levels will significantly aid in our clinical practices, enabling us to better diagnose, manage, and treat the various conditions that affect the head and neck. Let's pivot our discussion to the clinical implications associated with the facial vasculature, particularly focusing on a condition known as giant cell arteritis, also commonly referred to as temporal arteritis. This condition is an inflammatory vasculitis that predominantly targets large and medium-sized arteries. Most notably, it tends to involve branches of the external carotid artery, such as the temporal arteries. Now, why should we, as clinicians, be concerned about giant cell arteritis? Because, if left unaddressed, the inflammation can manifest as headaches, scalp tenderness, or jaw claudication, and more alarmingly, it can lead to sudden, irreversible vision loss. Consider this, giant cell arteritis primarily affects individuals over 50 and has a higher predilection in women. This demographic detail is crucial, it should raise our index of suspicion and prompt thorough evaluation in older patients who present with symptoms like persistent headaches or visual issues. Diagnosing giant cell arteritis is not straightforward. It relies heavily on a temporal artery biopsy, the definitive test for this condition. This procedure entails the removal and microscopic examination of a segment of the temporal artery to look for inflammatory markers, including the characteristic giant cells. Upon clinical suspicion of giant cell arteritis, we must act swiftly. The immediate administration of high-dose corticosteroids is imperative to control the inflammation and prevent the most dreaded complication, loss of vision. But treatment doesn't end there. Giant cell arteritis can be a persistent foe, requiring long-term management to avoid relapses. It's a condition that illustrates the delicate balance we must maintain in our clinical practice between vigilant diagnosis and the urgency of treatment. Cervical lymphadenopathy, characterized by swollen or enlarged lymph nodes in the neck, is another clinical condition closely associated with the facial vasculature. Cervical lymphadenopathy can arise from various etiologies, broadly categorized into inflammatory or metastatic origins. A particularly noteworthy association is with squamous cell carcinomas of the aerodigestive tract, which often lead to cervical metastatic lymph nodes. These malignancies can quietly spread, making vigilant detection crucial for patient outcomes. Palpation remains a critical clinical maneuver for assessing the presence and extent of lymphadenopathy. Through palpation, clinicians can discern the size, consistency, and tenderness of the lymph nodes. This tactile examination is invaluable, as metastatic nodes, often more rigid and immobile, contrast with the softer, movable nodes typically indicative of inflammatory processes. Given the complexity and density of the lymphatic network in the neck, a systematic approach to the evaluation of cervical lymph nodes is of utmost importance. This systematic examination can aid in staging cancers, determining prognosis, and planning therapeutic interventions. To conclude our discussion on the facial vasculature and lymphatic systems, it's important to recognize the remarkable complexity and redundancy built into these networks. The arterial supply to the face is notably rich in anastomosis, primarily depending on the carotid system. This system encompasses both the internal and external carotid arteries, each contributing to a robust blood supply to facial tissues. The interconnection between the superficial and deep arterial systems ensures a consistent blood flow, even if one pathway is compromised, highlighting the body's capacity for maintaining facial tissue vitality under various conditions. Similarly, venous drainage of the face is predominantly managed by three major veins, the internal jugular vein, the external jugular vein, and the anterior jugular vein. 
These vessels work in concert to efficiently return deoxygenated blood from the facial region to the heart, playing a critical role in the circulatory system. Complementing these vascular pathways is the lymphatic system, which in the facial region is both rich and complex. The network of lymph nodes, strategically located both superficially and deeply within the face and neck, serves as sentinel sites for immune response. These nodes are routinely examined for signs of infection or metastasis, as their condition can provide valuable insights into systemic health and disease processes. In clinical practice, an understanding of these systems is indispensable. Whether it's for surgical planning, cancer staging, or the management of infectious diseases, a thorough knowledge of the facial vasculature and lymphatic anatomy is crucial. It enables healthcare providers to diagnose conditions accurately, predict potential complications, and devise effective treatment strategies, ultimately leading to better patient care outcomes.